Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. Sorry for those uh, who were listening earlier and didn't catch, uh, or, or it was too quiet. We got it figured out. Uh, Dr. Swinburne is back with us, and we're going to be talking about are we bodies or souls? We're going to be going over uh, an argument from uh, Descartes for the existence of the soul and Dr. Swinburne's adjusted, um, amended uh, argument and some personal identity stuff. It's going to be really exciting. So let's uh, get right into it. If you want to support the podcast, support me on Patreon. Appreciate that. Links in the description. You can do a super thanks. And uh, we're going to have some time for some Q&A. So uh, if you guys, well, I'll give priority to super chats. Can't guarantee that we're going to get through all of them. But uh, yeah, go ahead and leave a super chat. If, if I don't get to yours, I'm sorry, but uh, consider it support for the podcast. So thank you for doing that. All right, here we go. Richard, thanks so much uh, for, for making this uh, happen again. I appreciate it. Can I hear your volume here? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right, perfect. Um, well, you people didn't really hear your first answer uh, to, uh, to the first question I asked, um, which was, you know, why did you get into philosophy of mind from uh, philosophy of religion? Um, yeah, can you, can you help us with that again? Sure. Um, I'm interested in all big questions about the nature of reality and what we can know about it. So naturally, I'm interested in uh, what human beings are. Are they just bodies? Are they brains? Are they souls or whatever? But this is uh, this issue is relevant to the philosophy of religion in a big way. Um, most theistic religions believe in an afterlife. That is to say, they believe that after our death, we shall live again, either on this earth or on some other um, environment. And uh, uh, that, whether that is logically possible depends on what we are. If we are just bodies, then that is not logically possible because, or at any rate, uh, for most of us um, these days, most people are most bodies of the dead people are burnt in crematoria mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, the the, uh, the flames of the crematorium turn a body into a chunk of energy and um, the chunk of energy resulting from uh, the burning of my body uh, wouldn't be different from the chunk of energy um, uh, resulting from the burning of your body any more than if you put a hundred dollars into the bank and then somebody else puts a hundred dollars into the bank there's no difference in the bank um yeah. uh, uh, uh into the same account that is to say in the bank uh, there's just two hundred dollars in the bank but it's not dividing it's uh, it doesn't have bits that come from you and bits that come from me there's right. just a, a sum and likewise with energy um uh, chunks of energy are the chunks they are, um, independent of where they come from. Um, and so, if that's if we are just bodies, or the same applies if we are just brains, um, we couldn't have a life after death. Mm -hmm. But um, if um, we, we are souls, then we could have a life after death. Now, the particular version of substance dualism, which I believe, consists in the view that human beings have two parts, bodies, physical objects, and souls, um, immaterial things connected to the bodies during our lives. And it's the, our soul that makes us who we are. Um, in life, it interacts with the body through our uh, in virtue of having a soul, we can move our bodies and we can learn about the world. But um, when the body ceases to function and uh, is burnt in the crematorium or perhaps the bones are saved and the bits are dissipated, um, then the soul is still there and um, it can be rejoined to another body or continue to exist without a body and that there are no uh, logical or metaphysical problems there. So one does need a theory of what humans are 
uh, mm. which allows the possibility of life after death if a central religious doctrine is to be maintained. The philosophy of religion is also um, um, interested in <laughs> another question in the philosophy of mind, which is, do we have free will? Uh, because um, if we don't have free will, then we are not responsible for our actions, and if we're not responsible for our actions, we can't be, as it were, um, blamed or punished justifiably for anything we do, and um, there will be a serious problem for any resolution of the problem of evil, because the problem of evil, of why God allows suffering, um, a central core of uh, producing an answer to that, in my view, is that uh, uh, a lot of suffering is due to humans causing others to suffer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's uh, God gives us that freedom. But if we don't have that freedom, then uh, clearly, uh, why does God, um, what's the point of God making us suffer if we're, um, it's, it's not our fault? Or even if um, natural evil is, you know, evil of diseases and so on, is not our fault. Um, nevertheless, if we have free will, we have a choice of how to react to it mm -hmm. uh, freely. And therefore, if we have free will, um, we are largely responsible and have the opportunity to um, uh, make ourselves do, do right actions or do wrong actions. Um, and that is a major part of the answer to the problem of evil. So um, the right answer to these questions of whether we have free will and what we're uh, humans alike is crucial for the philosophy of religion, and that is a major reason why I'm interested in them. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. So uh, I'll just point the audience to uh, Mind, Brain, and Free Will, an, another great book by uh, Richard Swinburne, and Are We Bodies or Souls? That's the one that we're going to be talking about today, where he goes in a little bit deeper on uh, on Descartes' argument for uh, substance dualism. So I, I have a, a slide of Descartes' argument, and I thought I could just lay it out for us here. Um, so Descartes' argument for the soul goes, uh, premise one, I am a substance, which is thinking. Two, it is conceivable that I am thinking and I have no body. Three, it is not conceivable that I am thinking and do not exist. And then uh, what uh, Richard Swinburne says, uh, what he calls uh, Descartes' lemma is, I am a substance, which it is conceivable can exist without a body. And then we derive this conclusion, I am a soul, a substance, the essence of which is to think. Um, now, uh, Richard, I, I wanted to ask about uh, the cogito argument and, and whether or not that's a different argument than this argument for the soul. So cogito ergo sum, I, I, I am thinking, therefore I exist, or I think, therefore I am. Um, is is this argument the same as this? Is it related? Is it is it Does the cogito come before this argument? Um, just, just any initial thoughts on that? Uh. I don't think it's relevant to talk about this, actually. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's not an, it is an argument. I argue from, uh, Descartes argues from, I think, therefore I exist. And I suppose the way I've phrased the argument that you put in the handout, uh, this is, is number three, uh, that's to say, uh, or rather it's number one plus number three. Mm -hmm. um, um, it is not conceivable that I'm thinking and don't exist. Uh, so uh, if I'm thinking necessarily, necessarily if I'm thinking I exist and I am thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the, uh, so it is connected, yes. Yeah. Uh, but um, I don't think there's anything wrong with Gogito Ergo Sum. That's um, clear. And um, assuming that um, being a substance is just being a a constituent of the world, Descartes gives definitions of substance in different places, but mm -hmm. he would, I think, be satisfied with the notion that substance is just a thing that has properties and one of the things in the world. Uh, given that, then one and three are pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, and it all turns on two. Um, now, uh, do you want me to say why I don't think this argument works just as it is? Yeah, you uh, in, 
in the book, you give a, a minor and a major reason. Yeah. Um, can, do, do you have those on top of your head? Can you give those to us? Uh, well, the minor reason is what Descartes actually argues for is the formalization on the handout is my formalization of, of his argument. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, the conclusion, uh, I am a substance, the essence of which is to think, um, uh, Descartes interprets that as saying, uh, I think he, he, he fills it out a bit more, the whole essence of which is, is to think, mm -hmm. um, something like that. Um, uh, where are we? Um, yes. Um, the, the, the whole essence of I am a, the whole essence of which the whole essence of which is to think. Mm -hmm. Now that entails that well, if I'm not thinking, I don't exist, yeah. and that's um, well not very plausible. I mean, uh, there is such a thing as, as dreamless sleep, and there's no need for Descartes to deny that, and uh, he doesn't need to. Um, all he wants to say is that a soul is a or all you can get out of it is that a soul is a uh, having a soul is necessary for uh, my existence um, and um, uh, not that it's sufficient anyway, I've got this right now. yeah um, now where, where the, uh, the, the that is, in fact is the, is the major difficulty the, the minor difficulty uh, is uh, the sympathy that he's trying to prove too much that I, I wouldn't exist if I wasn't thinking and there's no need for him to, to do that. Um, and, and uh, Sorry, I expressed the other point the wrong way around. Uh, what it shows is that the argument shows um, at most that I am, that having a soul is sufficient. For yeah, but not necessary. Sufficient. Yeah. Um, if it works. That is to say, if the second premise is true, it certainly works. <laughs> um, I am a substance. It follows from one, two, and three. I am a substance which, it is conceivable, can exist without a body. And uh, if it's conceivable, then I'm understanding conceivable as entailing logically possible, in, in the same sense as is logically possible. Mm -hmm. um, and um, therefore, uh, uh, if I'm a substance which is thinking, and it's logically possible that I uh, don't have a body, uh, so having a body can't be necessary for my existence, um, um, uh, and if it's not necessary for my existence, uh, then um, I can exist without a body, and um, so long as I have a soul, uh, I would exist because um, if I'm thinking, um, I exist, um, and I don't need a body in order to think. You know, need, it's not logically necessary for my existence that I have a body in order to think, and therefore it's not logically necessary for my existence uh, uh, that I have a body, but it's uh, so long as I have a soul, that's sufficient. So that's sufficient for my existence. And I think that argument is, is valid. I don't think many people would wish to deny that unless they have a view of what conceivability, that conceivability is irrelevant. Yeah. Um, but if they think that conceive, conceivability simply means logically possible, that there's no... Uh, um, I think if they, that, that's what's meant, then I think the argument goes through. Mm. But of course, um, it doesn't show that I now have a soul. It yeah. shows that um, uh, if I had a soul, and um, then I could exist uh, without the body. But it doesn't show I actually have a soul. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where uh, it doesn't go wrong. And yeah. therefore, yeah, so I have your I have your amended argument as well uh, on yeah. the next slide. Um, sh should we should we move to that or do yeah. you have some, okay let's do that? So uh, you have this amended argument uh, 
you you soup up Descartes' argument for the soul. And premise one is, I am a substance which is thinking. Premise two, it is conceivable that while I am thinking, my body is suddenly destroyed. Three, it is not conceivable that I am thinking and I do not exist. And then the amended lemma is, I am a substance which it is conceivable can continue to exist while my body is suddenly destroyed. For it is inconceivable that any substance can uh, lose all its parts simultaneously and yet continue to exist. And it looks like the conclusion got cut off. But uh, the conclusion is, I am a soul, a substance whose essential property is the capacity for thought. It's only essential property is the capacity. Only essential property is the capacity for thought. Sure. Yeah. Now, the, the difference here is what I am <laughs> claim to be conceivable is not just that I exist. Um, without a body, uh, but that um, it's conceivable that when I have a body, e.g. now, mm -hmm. um, I could lose that body and yet continue to exist. So this, if this happens, then whatever is necessary for my existence must continue. But when, if it's conceivable, first I have a body and then lose it, if that was all there was to me, then I couldn't continue to exist. But if I have another part, and that's the essential part of me, then I could continue to exist. And it's only if there's another part that I could continue to exist. Because um, you can't, nothing can go on existing if all its parts are suddenly destroyed. And if the body is the only part, it couldn't, I couldn't go on. Logically, I couldn't. Um, and um, so, there's all that difference in the world. Um, and I can consider myself at any time, as it were, when I have a body. It is logically possible that now I could lose the body. Now, I'm using the word conceivable and logical possible interchangeably at the moment. We'll go into what conceivability is in a bit in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that surely is conceivable, and the one reason I give for this is um, um, the after death or the <laughs> near death experiences which some people have. Um, you know, they, it seems to them that um, they have uh, left temporarily left their body and are looking down on the body from above, mm -hmm. and therefore it's not their body anymore. They, they can't con control it, but they continue to exist. Now, of course, this may not be the correct interpretation of what happens. It may be that the person is having a delusion that this is what is happening. Um, uh, that that um, he's, he's really uh, just imagining it. Um, but um, even so, we understand what he's saying. We understand what the claim is. And that's enough to make it conceivable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, if the premises of this argument are true, um, the conclusion must be true. Um, so the issue always turns on premise two, as I phrased it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I really like this argument. I. I um... I wonder. I, I don't want to. I don't want to dive too deep into this or, or get too uh, off track. But I wonder if someone would take issue with premise one again. Um, you, you in the book you mentioned uh, Georg Lichtenberg, and he says, you know, all all Descartes knows when when he's when he's thinking, he doesn't know that he's thinking. He knows that there is thinking going on. And you give this reply about substances and properties, which I, I really, really like, and I wanted to share that with the audience. So what, what do you make if someone says, hey, look, premise one, I'm a substance which is thinking. That can't be shown from uh, the, the cogito because all you can know is that there's thinking going on, but not that you are the one thinking. Well, thinking, say, X, so-and-so, think, thinking is a property. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a property that the substance has. Um, and uh, as it were, there wouldn't be thinking um, just as it's, of course, a, a property that lasts over a period of time, but it's a property all the same. It's like being square or brown or anything. A thing couldn't 
that it couldn't be just that there is brownness. Mm -hmm. Something has to be brown. Um, it couldn't just be that there is squareness. Something has to be square. And it couldn't just be that there's motion. Something has to move. And likewise with thinking. Thinking is a property, and therefore something has to have it. Um, and um, so uh, the minimum must be that Descartes is aware that someone is thinking, but that, of course, is, is um, not all he is aware of. He's aware of, I am thinking. Yeah. And um, his knowledge is greater than someone's thinking. Um, it's it's more positive than that. Yeah. So I, I think that, into my mind, uh, deals with that matter. Okay. So so then you, um, and I think you're right, and um, you flesh that out in more depth uh, later in the book. Uh, you talk about different different types of designators, and I think, uh, Lord willing, we can get to that as well. But so you, you say that premise two is probably the one that people will uh, find most contentious or will want to target. It is conceivable that while I'm thinking my body is suddenly destroyed, um, so, so how do you how do you motivate this? How do you get uh, for the skeptic, I guess? Well, the initial um, understanding of conceivability is simply that it makes sense. There's no contradiction in it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can understand conceive in a subjective or objective way. That is, objectively, um, to say something is conceivable is to say there is no contradiction in it. In a subjective way, it's, it seems to me that there is no contradiction in it. Now, of course, it does seem to me, and it will seem to many people, uh, that there is no contradiction in this if they can make sense of the sort of thought experiments that I've mentioned. Um, but they may say, why should its seeming be evidence that it really is? And the quick answer to that is, everything we purport to know about the world starts mm. from seeming, and if seeming isn't evidence that something is so, then um, we wouldn't know anything. Yeah. It only seems that I'm talking to you, and that's a very good reason for supposing I am. If it wasn't, if it hadn't moved, then uh, where would we start from? Right. Um, so, um, and uh, we, mu we must, as it were, trust our reason. If we can't trust an argument or see a contradiction or so on, then uh, um, we're, we're lost. And uh, uh, that being the case, uh, the evidence that something is conceivable is that it makes sense. We see that um, in the objective sense, it makes sense. We can see what it's saying. It doesn't appear to entail a contradiction. Of course, it may, <laughs> 15 lines down the an argument entail a contradiction. But mm -hmm. until that's shown, one has to assume that it does. And in that sense, it is conceivable, or at mm. least it so looks. And off we go. And the objection which I devote most time in the book to considering is what I, the most, the one most uh, uh, used by objectors to it today, and that is, you don't know what you're referring to by I, mm -hmm. and so you couldn't know what it is, whether or not it's conceivable, or I'm right. thinking or not. Maybe I refers to my body, or maybe it refers to something underlying my body, which uh, I know not of. And that is the objection. Yeah. And that led to my distinction between informative designators and uninformative designators. Uh, an informative designator is one which, if you know what it means, you know what it refers to. And an uninformative designator is one, if you know what it means, you don't necessarily know what it refers to. And I am arguing that uh, it's an informative designator. And if it's an informative designator, then you do know what you are referring to. Um, you know, uh, you, uh, or rather, you know what you're referring to when you're using it in what I call ideal circumstances. That's to say, when you're rightly positioned relative to what you're talking about and you're not subject to illusion, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, your faculties are working properly. properly. 
But when you are just thinking and aware of yourself as thinking, uh, you know what you are referring to. You are referring to this thing that is doing the thinking, the thing that you're most aware of, uh, because thinking has to belong to something, and you know what it is because you are directly aware of it. Um, and that's what you are aware of. Um, and um, you couldn't, and uh, in that circumstance, this is the ideal condition for the application of I, because um, if you can't be subject to an illusion, you can't be really, well, I think I'm thinking in practice, somebody else is doing the thinking and I'm not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not possible. Um, and um, your faculties are merely faculties of awareness of your own mental states, and um, therefore there's no possibility of an illusion there. Um, and um, you can't be mistaken about the immediate content of your mental life. Um, and um, uh, your faculties work properly, and uh, uh, there it is. Um, so I understand I because I know what it's referring to in ideal circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, I know what it's referring to in the sense that I know the necessary and sufficient conditions for being I in those circumstances. But knowing necessary and sufficient conditions isn't necessarily a matter of knowing a definition. It's having the ability to recognize when the word applies and when it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, and um, that's what is the case here. Um, I know in these circumstances when we are talking about myself as a subject of thought, I know <laughs> what is ne when it's true and I know when it isn't. And that's, that's all there is to it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to jump back on uh, the amended argument and see um, how how the uh, amendments that you made can help you avoid your minor and major objections to Descartes' original argument. You said you know it's a, it's a good argument, but it's um, it only shows that you ex you exist while you're thinking, and it's also it it only shows that a soul is sufficient for existence, but not necessary. And and that's important. You want it to be sufficient and necessary, uh, and you want to exist while you're not thinking. We have dreams where we're not conscious, perhaps, uh, though Descartes would say now. Um, so how does the amended uh, the, the amended lemma, the, uh, the amended premise two, um, how does that help us avoid the uh, major and minor um, uh, well, reasons? Uh, they, what I call the minor objection is, is simply to the way Descartes phrased, um, uh, Phrase premise one, that's to say, he thought what he says is, or rather, what he, sorry, the way he phrased his conclusion, his mm -hmm. conclusion was uh, that I am a soul, the whole essence of which is thinking. Um, and um, that implies that uh, if I'm not thinking, I don't exist. Um, well, there's no need for him to, to reach that conclusion. Uh, all he needs to reach is the conclusion that I am a soul whose only essential property is the capacity, and the word is capacity for thought. Um, uh, when we're asleep, we have the capacity for thought, because if someone wakes us up, we can think. Yeah. Um, and um, But on the other hand, if we're a corpse, nobody can wake us up, so we've lost the capacity for thought. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so w when you say, um, okay, so only a central property is the capacity for thought. Some people will want to push back on that. But, you know, there's you know, there's feelings and there's all sorts of other stuff that uh, that is essential to me. Even if I go along with you and say, I'm not essentially a soul uh, rather than a body. And so I just wanted to to get, you know, what what do we mean by thought? Here? Does it, I think in the book, yeah, you include other things. Descartes himself says uh, somewhere, and I, I quote, quoted that. Um, that um, he, he means by thought all, all the typical uh, uh, mental states. Um, that's to say, uh, intentions and feelings and so on. Um, uh, I could find the quotation, but he himself means that, and indeed I do. 
that is to say, what is essential for me is some, uh, the ability to have conscious events, to be conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, it may take the form of thought in, in a narrower sense of thinking about philosophy or something, but so long as it includes, it may take the form of uh, performing an intentional action or um, uh, having a sensation or a belief or a desire. Um, it's all, it's the uh, capacity to have mental events, mental events being those to which the subject has privileged access. Mm -hmm. Just to say, I know better than anyone else. I may not know perfectly, but I know, I know better than anyone else, or I can know better than anyone else what I'm thinking about, what I'm feeling, what I believe, and so on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that's some. Um, so that, that's the first first point. Um, uh, so he needn't claim that. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, that uh, I, I don't exist when, when I am not thinking at all in, in that wide sense. All he needs, all he ought to be able to uh, conclude from this is that I'm a soul whose only essential property is the capacity for thought. Mm -hmm. um, because if I have the capacity for thought when I'm exercising it, of course I exist, but that, that, that allows the possibility that I exist when I'm not exercising. Right, and um, but it's the the issue is um, well yes, and yeah, it meets the the, t the two difficulties. This the first difficulty being this is trying uh, to prove to narrow a claim that I only exist I exist only when I'm thinking. Um, it, all that one needs to say is that. <laughs> Uh, so long as I have the, it proves that when I have the capacity for thought, I exist. And but the wider thing is that um, the original argument did not show that um, having a soul was a necessary condition of my existence, only that it was a sufficient condition. Yeah, yeah. that's that's really helpful. I love I love the uh, your amended argument there. I uh, just a. a, a a peripheral question um when, when so i'm a soul a substance uh whose you know soul capacity or whose only uh, essential capacity is for thought um is that soul uh, synonymous with mind do you use those interchangeably or does the substance uh, the soul have a mind or, or something like that i avoid this word mind yeah um, i specifically say that because it could be used in innumerable senses People are said to have a mind just because they can uh, they can give an argument or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using soul in Plato's sense. Yeah. It's, it's a separate thing from me which constitutes my existence. It isn't a physical thing, physical thing being something to which everybody has equal access. Mm -hmm. It is something to which I have privileged access. Um, and indeed infallible access, uh, access. Um, and um, it's what makes me me, but it's not a physical thing, but it is in temporary uh, interaction with a physical thing, my body. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. How about, um, this is another one that could be kind of bog us down into a morass, but is, is the soul... Um, we're going to talk about personal identity over time and how the soul is, is uh, so important for that. Is the soul the person, or does the person have a soul? Does uh, well, um, the body is part of me, of course, but it's not an essential part. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's the sense of I have a soul is just that the soul is a part of me. Of course, it's an the one and only essential part of me, in my view, but it's a part all the same. Yeah. Um, and um, so in that sense, I have a soul. Mm -hmm. But um, for all the mental predicates, um, it is the case, 
uh, or rather for all the pure mental predicates, those that don't entail the existence of body, um, for all the pure mental predicates, it is the case that if I think, then my soul thinks, and I think because my soul thinks. If I have a, um, a pain, then uh, my soul has a pain, and I have a pain because my soul has a pain. Mm. Uh, there's nothing strange about that. I mean, <laughs> if I have a tattoo, um, um, I have a tattoo because my arm has a tattoo, but uh, there's only one tattoo. It <laughs> like goes with the, uh, uh, the relation between me having pure mental property and my soul having pure mental property. Yeah. I, th I think that's helpful. Uh, that lets duelists avoid uh, the too many thinkers problem that yes, animalists yes. Uh, run into. That's right. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, well, so so on that note, then, you you, you argue that having a soul is um, is necessary for personal identity over time. Is that the right language? Is that is that too strong? Um, or is, uh, it, is no. it the best explanation or it is necessary? Uh, uh, it is necessary and sufficient for my existence, mm. um, and um, <laughs> it's necessary. And uh, when I discuss, uh, as it were, the argument from neuroscience, um, uh, all that, that shows is that the having a soul is necessary. It doesn't show that it's sufficient. Mm. Okay. Um, well, so you use. Uh, you set up different theories of, of uh, personal identity. You got complex theories, and then you have the, the simple theory. Um, what distinguishes uh, a complex theory from, from a simple theory? Can you just help us out with that? Uh, yeah, well, a uh, complex theory says that uh, these, a theory of personal identity, uh, which we mean diachronic personal identity, mm -hmm. what makes me or anyone the same person as a person at an earlier time or at a later time, um, a complex theory analyzes that in terms of having the, <laughs> the same body or having the same brain or having the uh, uh, same sort of memories, um, all of which are things that you can have to different degrees. Mm -hmm. You can have some of the same body or some of the same brain or uh, some of the same memories. And uh, the, they're complex in the sense that uh, you have to have enough of, according to these theories, enough of the same body or enough of the same brain or enough mm -hmm. memories and so on. Um, and of course, they, they spell out what constitutes enough and they usually say it's not merely having enough of these, but having uh, the, the, the body or brain or mental life at the later time has to be causally, uh, has to be caused in part by the mental life or brain or body at the earlier time. Um, but um, it's the degree, but um, causation is not going to be enough, is it? Uh, uh, I could cause things to happen to your brain without, in any sense, uh, it being my brain. Yeah. Um, and uh, but um, so they all say, well, if you have enough of this, um, then that's what makes uh, me me at the later time. Uh, as opposed to the simple theory, which says either that person is or that person isn't, and this is not further analyzable in terms of any property or stuff which mm -hmm. is capable of division. Yeah. And, and you go on to motivate this uh, with your Alexandra uh, argument. Uh, and oh. and it, it does so much work. It's really, really cool. Um, do you do you want to lay that out? Do you, do you, um, the the no, uh, brain transplants? Simple, really. um, uh, I'm I do it in terms of current neuroscience, but it would work if the neuroscience was a bit different. But the neuroscience is, um, our thoughts, feelings, our mental life are dependent on the operation of our cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that's um, on the top. Um, and um, we have a left hemisphere, the brain, and a right hemisphere, and they each got cerebral cortexes. Mm. And um, it's a very interesting neural fact that 
some people, unfortunate people, have had to have most or even all of the, one of their cerebral cortexes removed uh, in an operation um, called an anatomical hemispherectomy. Uh, they, this is done if in very acute cases of epilepsy. It's a, a way of dealing with it. Now, you might think that made a difference to the person. The interesting thing is, well, it does make some difference um, to their motor capacities. They can't immediately move uh, both arms or anything like that. Mm. It makes little difference to uh, the, their thoughts and feelings and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, see, well, one of these hemispheres is enough to have the thoughts and feelings and so on. You do. Okay. But now suppose that um, one of your hemispheres is removed and the hemisphere is removed from some other person and uh, what was my left hemisphere uh, is put in the other person instead of their left hemisphere and connected up to their body. Now, of course, this operation can't yet be done and it may take many decades before it can be done, but there's no reason in principle why it can't be done because um, uh, surgeons are now beginning to learn how to mend spinal injuries. That is to say, where um, somebody's uh, uh, spinal nerves have been cut or <laughs> broken, and they, they can't move their um, arms and legs. And they, they, the neurons which make up a spinal uh, tract are the same sort of neurons as make up the brain. And um, if uh, they, they can mend these, uh, then they can put uh, uh, some other one instead of it. And um, so it ought, in theory, to be possible uh, to replace a hemisphere by a hemisphere taken from someone else. Mm -hmm. It's not... Um, Hemispheres are, are fairly separate in the brain. They are connected to each other in the middle by um, a, a, a tract of nerves and one or two minor tract of nerves. The corpus callosum, uh, or something, yes, right? the corpus yeah. callosum, and um, uh, there are well, other connections. But I mean, it's not just <laughs> cutting out a quite a, an arbitrary chunk of the brain or anything like right. that. Uh, so it ought, in theory, to be possible. Okay, but now uh, suppose that other person has both their hemispheres removed and one of my hemispheres, the left, put there. That person, because all their thoughts and feelings are dependent on the hemisphere, will clearly claim to have been me. Mm -hmm. And I will claim to have been me. And in all respects, um, the, ex the extent to which each of, at least so it looks, um, uh, each uh, each of us uh, makes these claims and there doesn't seem any reason for preferring one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, or if you think there is, because uh, the brainstem, in, as I described this experiment, is the same in both cases, well, can suppose that uh, both hemispheres are removed from me and each of them put in a different body so that, as it were, the brainstem is, uh, <laughs> isn't at all the same. Uh, but um, that oughtn't to make any difference because um, uh, the brain, uh, this is, doesn't seem to be uh, essential for consciousness. Um, and consciousness what the content, it may be essential to being conscious, but what the content of consciousness is depends on the cerebral cortex. So, um, you get the situation of brain, half brain transplants, uh, uh, and that raises the issue of which, if either of the subsequent persons, is the same as the original person. Mm -hmm. And um, what is a, a complex theory to say about this? Well, the complex theory, I have to say, well, it depends on just whether they have uh, more memories or whether they have a bit more of the brain or so on. Yeah. But 
the, the problem is this looks extraordinarily arbitrary. Um, you know, 50%, 51%, 52%, how much do you need? Um, it would be absurd to say that just because one of these guys has 51% and the other has 49%, this one is and that one isn't. That would be highly arbitrary. And they're not going to be exactly the same. Uh, there are certain things for which the left hemisphere is much more needed than for the right hemisphere and conversely. Right. Uh, so um, they're not going to be exactly the same. And it may be that the, what makes me it's essential to me is carried by the left hemisphere, it may be it's carried by the right hemisphere, but there's no way of finding out since most of the, what is essential to my life of thought is carried by both hemispheres. Yeah. Um, and um, any uh, account, and there are plenty of accounts in the literature of philosophers who thought of, um, says it's me if, um, as if it has uh, more of the brain, more of the memories, um, or um, they sometimes had a clause, so long as uh, uh, <laughs> the other person doesn't have very much or something like that, but it's highly arbitrary. And um, um, arbitrary if there's only one transplant, to say it isn't me, and uh, if uh, in, in most of these uh, cases, uh, there will be uh, the possibility of a second person with a, uh, an equal claim to be me. Uh, and um, so, I mean, all of the, all the theories which analyze personal identity in terms of continuity or properties or stuff which makes the person that person are open to this uh, objection. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I love this objection, and I love thinking about like a, a set of triplets, and you take, you know, a hemisphere from this one and put in this one and this, and you can just keep shuffling them around, and uh, I think it really draws out the the argument well that like, it's not the complex theories are are insufficient for personal identity over time. Um, I the the book you, you do such a good job in the book, so I definitely commend this to everyone. I, I have a couple. Um, more tangential questions again for you. Um, so, so folks, like read the read this book because the treatment's really, really well done. But uh, Richard, do you do you think that um, do you think that souls are like are are they spatially located? Do they follow a certain amount of the brain if it's transferred? Um, what, what do you make of that? Well, uh, uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's reasonable to suppose that if uh, only a tiny bit of my brain is removed uh, and I go on behaving in the same way and so on, uh, there's no reason to postulate that uh, a different person is in charge because mm -hmm. this is, it would be uh, an arbitrary supposition to suppose uh, that the mere removal of one bit which makes no difference to behavior and so on is going to make any difference to who is in charge of it. Uh, but um, when you get to the uh, more extreme cases of uh, changing brains and so on, um, the answer is I don't know uh, mm -hmm. where I go. And that's just the point. That is the point that I don't know. It doesn't follow from the description of what has happened um, in public terms and nothing follows it. Uh, as to which person is me. But of course, the more um, the later person has memories similar to mine, and uh, the more the later person has brain similar to mine, the more probable it is that okay. that's me. But that's the most you can say. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll ask two more questions, and, and while I do that, and while, um, while Richard is responding, folks, go ahead and put your questions in the live chat. Again, I will prioritize uh, super chats because I can see them better, and because uh, you're supporting the podcast. So, uh, so two follow-up questions uh, as people are, are typing their questions in the chat. There, um, one is about uh, memories um, and and near-death experiences. Do you does sometimes um, when when substance dualists talk about I'm a substance dualist myself, but when when someone's coming on to help me think through substance dualism, um, they'll they'll kind of refer to the soul as if it's um, like a bare particular or um, 
or yeah, the the soul just has this cap the soul capacity. Yeah. The there, there's only one essential property, and that is the capacity for thought, right? Yeah. Does the soul? Do you think the soul remembers things, or is it just this like this thing with one property that is just the capacity for thought? Like, do you know what I'm yes. getting at there? Yes, I do, and it's a very important question. This. Um, I don't discuss this que that question in this book. That I do discuss it in Mind, Brain, Free Will. Mm -hmm. um, it's the the view that, as it were, with the, when we have memories and um, indeed the whole beliefs and desires which continue over time, um, whether the continuity is due to the beliefs, desires, and memories inhering in the soul, mm -hmm. or whether it is due to the brain being in such a state that it always throws up the same memories and right. desires, and so, on, mm -hmm. so long as that soul is connected with it. And they call the first view the categorical view, and the second view the dispositional view. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think it's... I wouldn't wish to uh, come down very strongly on either side in this okay. matter, but I think the, there is reason for believing that the, the categorical theory is to some extent right. I mean, to some extent means well, well, perhaps some of these things in here in the soul and others don't. Oh, okay. Uh, and the, the reason is this. Um, uh, I suppose you're going walking from A to B, and um, you know the route, and um, uh, you take this turn and that turn and then this turn and that turn, and you take this turn and that turn and so on because of your beliefs. You believe that if I take this turn, I will reach this road, and then if I reach this road and go that way, then I'll get there. But uh, you never think of this while you're actually walking because you're familiar with this situation. You may be talking about philosophy to someone as you're doing the journey. Yeah. Uh, but the belief is influencing your conduct, um, but not merely when you're conscious of it, but when you're not conscious of it. Um, um, and uh, that suggests that... <laughs> Uh, but beliefs um, are pretty central uh, things uh, to you. Uh, um, how can I express it a bit better? Um, uh, no, I don't think I can express it a bit better. Uh, it, it is just that... Um, They, the beliefs of which you are conscious interact with the beliefs of which you are not conscious. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're both beliefs. Um, I may, when I'm walking along, have certain beliefs which I am conscious of, is that I am talking to Jones and uh, therefore we go, need to go together and so on and so forth. And that is interacting with my beliefs which are unconscious and directing the steps I take. Now, this is, clearly our beliefs influence us when we are conscious mm -hmm. um, of them, but th this shows that our beliefs influence us when we are not conscious of them. And it would be strange if the way the beliefs influence us was different according to whether we were conscious of them and whether we were not conscious of them. Yeah. Um, and um, that doesn't solve it all together, but it does suggest, um, because if you take the dispositional view, that is, where they're not there until they're needed, yeah. until <laughs> we're conscious of them, uh -huh. um, uh, that has the consequence that, um, as it were, we... Uh, their influence on our conduct is very different from the their influence of our conduct when we are conscious of them. Yeah. For example, when we are actually doing an argument from belief A to belief B. And for that reason, I do go along with the categorical 
um, view for to some extent. Well, I don't think that argument's conclusive, but it does tip it in that direction. Mm -hmm. And of course, it would be more convenient for a religious view if the con categorical view were true, because um, we would arrive if we arrive at life after death without the original body then we wouldn't have all the bad uh, tendencies and all the memories <laughs> of our evil deeds and so on yeah uh, this, and it would seem you know why am i being punished or whatever <laughs> right uh, whereas if they inhere in us um then that that makes sense um so that is certainly desirable for mm -hmm. Religious view. I don't think it's necessary because God would know, as it were, what the soul had done, but we wouldn't be aware of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. what I think about that. Okay, that's really helpful. I, I think also with with uh, NDEs, with near death experiences, um, whether you take those to be uh, vertical or not, like if if you do, then there is some uh, some more evidence for the categorical categorical view that like our memories in here in our soul oh yes I mean, i'm a bit doubtful about those experiences okay. I must say, but, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah okay all right so last one for me and then we're going to move to audience questions and again it's kind of a more speculative one but as as a substance dualist uh richard do you think it's possible for humans to create artificial consciousness which with um you know similar qualitative experiences to ourselves yeah. well the only evidence that anyone is conscious is that they have the sort of brain that we have. Uh, it's not enough to say, uh, not enough evidence of consciousness to say they react in a certain way. You could have a machine which no one would think was conscious, uh, made of steel and silicon chips, which if you stick a pin in it, it'll scream. Yeah. Uh, also, you could, and uh, uh, the computer scientists are on their way to making one that would pass the original Turing test of talking to me for an hour. Uh, but um, uh, the fact that um, some machine uh, reacts in the way that we do, because it's been made to, yeah. it doesn't show that what's going on in the machine is causing it in the same in the way that what's going on in us is causing us to behave in this yeah. way. So, uh, what we would want is evidence that um, the sort of thing is that's happening in the machine uh, is uh, that in the machine uh, uh, there's the that uh, there is going on in the machine the sort of thing that goes on in our brains mm -hmm. when we are conscious. Now, of course, this crucially applies to the case of animals. Um, uh, invertebrates don't have our sort of brain. And for that reason, they may be conscious, but we have no good reason to suppose they are. They mm. just react. Um, and um, uh, higher up the scale, um, we have... Uh, very little reason, I think, to suppose that uh, there's very much consciousness until you get to the mammals. But anyway, the point is, the argument goes, look, uh, this creature has a prefrontal con uh, cortex, and things happen in that context of the sort that happens, cortex, the sort that happens in us, when someone sticks a pin in me. So, probably that being is conscious. So, as regards our making something, if we make something out of silicon chips, um, I don't see that which reacts in the right way. I don't see any grounds for supposing it is conscious. It might be. But if, if we made it out of bits of the sort of thing we may are made of, uh, that's to say, if we brought it into existence not by a sexual procurer, procreation, but by a surgical operation which took bits from bits <laughs> from various dead bodies and, and stirred them up, then it might well be conscious. Mm. Uh, be... Okay. okay. So so maybe we can we can hack into like the psychophysical laws that, that God set up to establish soul body connections? Um 
yeah, well, yes, I, I, I'm inclined to think there are soul body uh, laws, um, but and this is the all important thing. Laws of nature are laws which say something of this kind with this sort of property will cause something of that kind with that sort of property. Um, an arrangement of uh, bodies with this sort of mass and this sort of velocity will lead to bodies with this sort of mass and that sort of velocity. Um, and uh, mixing this and that chemical substance would make a substance of that kind. But, uh, um, and therefore the laws, of psychophysical laws, would have the form of when a human fetus reaches this stage, then it produces, causes the existence of a soul. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say it causes the existence of this soul. It doesn't say it causes me or anything else. Because what makes me me is not anything ex <laughs> uh, uh, is, uh, is not analyzable further. Right. Um, and I argue that I have thisness, that is to say, Instead of me, there could be a human being who had just the same life, um, same life history and so on, uh, uh, came into being in the same way, but wasn't me. That also seems to make sense, and I can give a further argument for it if you want to know. Uh, but to say that is to say that souls have thisness. Yeah. And souls aren't the only thing that may have thisness. It's a serious discussion uh, in uh, physics as to whether fundamental particles have thisness. That is to say, would the world be different if instead of a certain electron here, there was another different electron there? would have all the same properties as the first electron, it would be in the same place and so on, um, and um, uh, the same history. But uh, could it be different? The normal answer in physics is no, because electrons don't have thisness. So any electron in that place with just those properties would be the same electron. Yeah. And it seems to me that isn't the case with humans. Um, instead of me, there could be a different one who was different just in the respect it was me. And if that's right, then... <laughs> uh, then no scientific law could explain that because scientific laws never deal with mm. things that have thisness. Yeah. They only deal with things in virtue of their properties and the properties that of the person thrown up by my brain might be just the same, mine and the fetus would be just the same as the properties um, thrown up. Uh, uh, even if uh, it wasn't me who had these properties, but had this up yeah. someone else. Um, and um, once again, my argument for that is firstly from conceivability. I can't, we can make sense of this suggestion, but um, I could make a further point. But I'm concerned about your audience. Yeah. yeah. So, so thisness is like a. It's a. It's an essential property to me. It's a quiddity or a hexity or something where it's just. It's mine. You can't have it, and it, that's it. You can't analyze it anymore. Yeah, I really like that. All right. Well, that's that's enough for me. Um, I appreciate it. Those, those those were really fun. Um, let's get to the first super chat here. Um, <clears throat> all right. This is from uh, Adrian. He says, "What do you think about hylomorphism uh, views? Hylomorphic yes. views?" Uh, this is uh, the Thomist view um, that um, uh, what uh, I consist in is. Uh, having a soul, my soul, and having this body. Um, and um, that is to say that uh, the body is not merely a body, but this body is necessary for me. I have to have both mm -hmm. a body and a soul, and indeed this body. Now, uh, and it's hylomorphism because um, on this view, the soul is the form of the body. That's to say, it's the way the body behaves. Um, 
and uh, uh, Hule is, is matter, it's the way the matter behaves uh, that uh, forms me. Um, it's the way that um, the matter that's me uh, behaves in the sense of throws up thoughts and feelings and so on, as well as doing public acts. And that's what makes it me. Now, I think um, that is mistaken. Um, uh, but uh, I think I better say what, <laughs> why uh, uh, the only version that uh, the average Thomist will give you um, isn't really a hypomorphic view at all. Hmm. Um, because uh, it all hylomorphism dates back to Aristotle and Aristotle said um, that what makes this desk the desk it is is the matter of which it's made and the shape in which it's formed and of course that's so for stationary physical objects and it would also be so for physical objects which have properties of motion um, what makes uh, the car the car it is it is uh, partly the way that it will behave over time, and that's a property of it. So uh, it's the matter of which the thing is made and the properties which are instantiated in it. Mm -hmm. And um, Aquinas thought that that's what makes uh, me <laughs> the person I am. But for Aristotle, properties are universals. That mm -hmm. is to say, uh, what makes the desk the desk it is, is first that it's a desk, and the de being a desk is a property possessed by this chunk of matter. Mm -hmm. But then on this view, um, as adjusted by Aquinas, um, if one took that model seriously, then um, every soul would be the same. That is to say, it would have its soul would be the form of humanity. The universal um, form, yeah. Yeah, well, not the universal form, but the form of being human. Yeah. Um, all humans would have the same form, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it would be their bodies which distinguish them. Yeah. But in that case, uh, the soul would not be the, the form of this body. Um, it it's would be the general uh, form of humanity. Uh, and souls don't individuate by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, has, the, the individuation on the Aristotelian model consists in the chunk of matter. Right? But uh, Aquinas would accept, uh, the holomorphic theory would have to uh, accept, uh, that um, the soul can exist by itself. And uh, what makes it, it is uh, therefore not carried by the body. Uh, Aquinas, of course, wants to say that the soul is not the whole person. But the mere um, admitting that our soul can exist without the body commits him to the view that uh, identity is carried partly, at least, yeah. by the soul. And that gives him a view of soul which is utterly different from the notion that it's just a collection of properties. Yeah. Um, furthermore, of course, in saying that, um, uh, for Aristotle, properties can't really exist unless there are things in which they exist. Mm. Uh, uh, desks. The property of deskness doesn't exist except where there are desks. Right. No um, uninstantiated forms, right? Yeah. But uh, the form, the soul, which is the form of body, um, the form of the body, according to Aristotle, according to Aquinas, must both be individual and capable of existing without uh, the body. So it's a very, for, a very strange form of uh, Aristotelian soul. And it seems to me that if it can exist by itself, um, uh, if it can exist on its own and have, as Aristotle, as Aquinas wanted to say, a certain conscious life without 
um, uh, without the body thing, uh, uh, seems that a person exists without a body. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, uh, Aquinas goes on about uh, uh, the souls of the saints in heaven uh, uh, are always praying for us and so on and so forth, but <laughs> if they have the souls are praying for us, surely the saints are praying for us. Right. And uh, uh, so, um, as used in, in a Christian context, it simply is boils down to Descartes' own view, I think. Yeah. But of course, you could take it uh, a little more seriously and say, well, what makes me me is really a form, if Aristotle sends, um, and a form of humanity. And what makes me me is the, the chunk of the form of humanity being instantiated in this particular chunk. Mm -hmm. but that runs into all the problems of how much of this particular chunk right. we were talking of earlier. Yeah, complex. Uh, you know, if I lose an arm, it's still me. If I lose half a brain, is it still me? Huh. Um, all these problems re-emerge. Yeah. Um, unless you suppose that the soul has individuation, is individuated, um, has, contains its own principle of individuation, and hence a uh, simple view of the soul. And... Um, uh, if you do that, and therefore allow that it could, uh, that what makes a person the person it is, is not just the form or the chunk of matter, it's something else, um, then it, the hylomorphic theory begins to collapse into Descartes' view. Yeah. So my answer is <laughs> Aquinas' view is really in essence the same as Descartes' view. Yeah. Uh, only he's unwilling to admit it. Um, uh, but if you took it uh, seriously as a hylomorphic view, it would be back with Aristotle, and that leads to all the problems uh, we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I love that. And you did you did mention uh, a bit of that in in Are We Bodies or Souls and yeah, comparing sure. Descartes and and uh, and Thomas there. Uh, so that's so great. They 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 will run into uh, if you take it too seriously the arbitrariness objection or the more than one candidate objection yeah. that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's go to uh, another question here. Um, this is from Chad. What explanatory virtues does dualism have over panpsychism? Uh, well, um, let's have a look at panpsychism. Um, panpsychism says everything is conscious. Well, uh, what earthly reason have you got to believe that? Hmm. Um, it's uh, multiplying consciousnesses beyond necessity to start with. Um, uh, <laughs> to explain all the things around us um, in terms of... Uh, we know that we are conscious. Other people are very like us in the way they're constituted. Uh, animals are somewhat like us in the way they're constituted. That's good reason to believe that they are conscious. But we have no reason to believe that desks and tables and chairs are conscious. Um, then, of course, the man psychist says, well, it's not desks and tables and chairs. It's uh, the atoms of which things are made that, that have consciousness. But that runs into the trouble about, well, okay, I'm conscious, um, and uh, uh, so are the individual atoms of which I am made. They're conscious too. Uh, what's the relation between their consciousness and my consciousness? Mm -hmm. um, uh, my consciousness can hardly be said to be uh, the sum of these because... Um, <laughs> Either I'm conscious or I'm not. And if you take a bit away, sometimes it doesn't make a difference to my consciousness, and sometimes it makes all the difference to my consciousness. So um, I think panpsychism has these two problems. It, it attributes to material objects of consciousness when there's not the slightest reason to believe that they're consciousness of the sort that we have for believing other people and animals are consciousness. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it has the problem of explaining how um, both the, the stuff of which things are made 
each bit is conscious, and also the whole is conscious, and yet the whole's consciousness is not the same as the sum of the bits is consciousness. Because uh, I am, uh, the bits are conscious on their own, as it were, when they are separate. Uh, and uh, so they are conscious, uh, but I only have one consciousness. So um, both uh, what I'm made of and me are conscious, and uh, that does again proliferate things. Yeah. Uh, without explaining how the one is connected to the other. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. Um, all right, we got one. Uh, just, just let's do maybe just two more here. Um, Dr. Schumer, what are your thoughts on causal closure arguments against substance dualism? And I'll, I'll note that uh, you do talk about interactive dualism. You have a whole chapter in Mind, Brain, and Free Will. So I, I do recommend people grab both of these books and uh, give them a thorough reading. Um, I'm not quite certain what you mean about a causal closure argument. I wonder if you could uh, explain that. Yeah, maybe maybe like a, a conservation of energy type stuff, right? So so we, we have interactive oh, I see. dualism. Uh, causal yeah. closure of the physical. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I don't think the physical is causally closed. Um, uh, I discussed this in chapter six of this book. Um, if you uh, suppose that um, the physical is causally closed, you therefore only get the only uh, causal interaction between the physical and the mental was not an interaction it would be a one-way business uh, from from the brain to the soul um, and uh, uh, if uh, you thought that was the case then um, how would you know anything about what had, how would you uh, be able to rely on your memories? Uh, how would you be able to know what other people are telling you, etc.? Now, the way this works is like this. Um, suppose I do a certain thing today and I remember the next day that I've done it. How is this uh, procedure, uh, what's happening? Well, the normal view, and surely correctly, is that my doing it yesterday laid down some trace in the brain, and uh, that trace in the brain uh, caused it, it to pop up the next day. But then, <laughs> that is already pos uh, postulating in stage one a downward action, an mm -hmm. action from the mental to the physical. And if you think that doesn't happen, then uh, why on earth should we believe our memories? Because they wouldn't be able to influence our present mental state. And um, likewise, uh, if, if you know about other people's mental states and what they do and so on, because they tell you it. But if you thought um, and you believe them because you believe they are trying to tell you the truth. But if you thought that there was no downward action, you wouldn't think that the words that come out of their mouths were caused by their beliefs. Mm. <laughs> uh, because beliefs can't cause uh, things. So generally, unless you're to be totally skeptical, you've got to believe there's a downward causation. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. I, I love that. Um, uh, one more from... from um... This one's from Scott Terry, who just sent in a $50 super chat, which is awesome. He, he's, he's awesome. He said um, the, evolu the evolution of the soul was one of the first philosophy works he ever read. So uh, there's a little uh, tip of the hat to you as well. But uh, Dr. Swinburne, so his question uh, in this one is, what are the implications of your position for models of the Trinity? And I wonder um, maybe if you could address like the, the thisness or quiddity or hexate too. Does that have any implications or, or did you come to your, your model of the Trinity in a different way? Oh dear, that is going to take us a long way, I think, from this. Sure. I think I'd rather not answer that question because okay. I have to go into a lot of things that uh, you know we're not talking about sure. today. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm just going to make one short point. 
Mm-hmm. But in my view, uh, the members of the Trinity do not have thisness. Okay. Um, so does, they does God are have... what they are in virtue of their relation to each other. That mm. is to say, the Father is the Father because he is the source of the Son and Spirit. Um, the Son is the Son because caused by the Father and not caused by the Spirit. And Spirit is the Spirit because co-caused by the Father and the Son. Uh, okay. They are what they are in virtue of their relations. We are not what we are in virtue of our relations. Yeah. That is the difference. Okay. Well, you said, uh, when you say co-caused, um, is that is that um, procession from the Father and the Son? Uh, well, it may be. Uh, there okay. are different ways in which it is expressed in the Western, Eastern Christianity, yeah. as you may be aware. <laughs> yeah. The Western doctrine, which was not in the original creed, but was uh-huh. added by later popes, uh, was that um, the, fa- the s- spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the East objected to that being put in the creed, but they're not necessarily against the truth of that doctrine. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and um, the Eastern doctrine can be uh, expressed in one of two ways. Either you say that, as it were, the uh, Son and the Spirit are each caused separately by the Father, and that would contradict the Western view, but it's also acceptable in Eastern Christianity to say that the Spirit is caused by the Father through the Son, Mm. and um, that seems to me tantamount to the Western doctrine. Um, and in fact, um, Aquinas uh, has a discussion of this, and Aquinas and Scotus, they, they both say that if you put the Eastern doctrine this way, then there is no real difference. Wow, that's awesome. I'm, gl- I'm glad to, to, I'm glad you made that clarification about thisness, because that would seem like, like a tritheism or something. But if the divine nature has thisness, then that, that's fantastic. Thanks for, so much for, for addressing that, even uh, even though it was, it was off topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Swinburne, uh, you've been you've been huge. This has been uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to change the audio and get that all figured out. Um, I, I just want to finish by saying uh, so many of us have really, really appreciated your work, have grown from it, have been able to defend our faiths uh be- because of your work and it continues to have ripple effects uh throughout throughout the world so thank you so much for what you do and for doing this as well okay, you're very kind i'm sorry about the initial uh, difficulties but no uh, there we are <laughs> i don't yeah. understand these machines <laughs> yeah me neither well that's gonna have to do it folks uh this has been parker's pensies and as always all glory to god okay